This video was brought to you by the wonderful people on screen here who support me over at Patreon. If you want to support this channel and what I do, then please check the link in the description or the link at the end of the video. Hey everyone, this video is going to be a bit different than what you're used to. I want to start doing some videos about history, and I think the best place to start is with Jesus mythicism. It's a position that I see a disproportionate amount of atheists holding, and I want to go over some of the common arguments of Jesus mythicism today, and some possible counters to them. I'd like to thank Chris Hansen from the Bible History Skeptics for helping with the research for this video. I was unfamiliar with a lot of the sources that I would need to reference in order to compile something like this, and for that, I'm in their debt. Please check out their channel, they're in the description below. With that said, let's get into one of the most common arguments for Jesus mythicism. Lack of evidence for Jesus. So, while some of these points will be expanded on later, there are a few sources that are commonly used when arguing for the historicity of Jesus. The most prominent ones being the writings of Josephus and Tacitus, as they were some of the historians that were closest to being contemporaries of Jesus. We have two passages from Josephus and one from Tacitus to look at. Starting with Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews, that was penned between 93 and 94 AD, has a decently long passage known as the Testimonium Flevianum. I'm probably horribly mispronouncing that. You'll see more of that as we go, I'm sure. The problem with the testimonium is that it seems that it was most likely not completely authentic, not in its entirety anyway, much of the same way that we know that some of the letters from Paul that made it into the Bible were authentic, and some were definitely not. But what about the other mention of Jesus that Josephus has? He has two. The second one can be reliably used as a method of determining that Jesus was, at least in some part, a historical figure, due to him being only a few degrees of separation from known historical figures. Josephus references James, the brother of Jesus. The Jesus in question was the one who was called Christ. It mentions it fairly explicitly. So according to Josephus, James was in fact the brother of the Jesus that we would know of from the Bible. This has nothing as to whether or not the multiple miracles attested to Jesus were in fact true. This only has to do with whether or not the person those miracles are attributed to did indeed exist or at the very least had a high probability of existence. Paul, who is a known historical figure, does reference meeting and interacting with James, the brother of Jesus. And since we have Josephus and Paul both writing about a James, brother of Jesus, it is likely that this particular Jesus existed due to only being a degree of separation away from known historical figures. Tacitus is our next example, but Tacitus describes specifically a Christus, noting him as the figurehead of a religion he called Christianity. He also noted that he deemed Christianity to be a disease of the populace. Apparently his opinions weren't terribly high of Christianity, but his personal opinions on the religion don't actually matter for the argument. He notes that the figurehead known as Christus was executed by Pontius Pilate in his Annals, which were written in 116 AD. A couple of decades after Josephus' writings, and several decades after Paul's, it is actually due to the fact that Tacitus speaks very ill of the Christian faith in his articles that some scholars, like Robert Van Forst, say that it's more likely that it's true that a Christus was in fact executed by Pontius Pilate. One of the main things that is usually used to undermine any possible historical documentation on the historical Jesus is the claim of Christian interpolation. Things like a passage in Josephus that says that there once was a man named Jesus who did many great works seem to be overtly positive descriptions of the character. Noting also that many of Josephus' writings are not used because of this very reason. Tacitus, however, doesn't necessarily have the same bias in his writings. He's overtly negative towards the faith and the figurehead. So, so far in our case, we have at least evidence of a person whose name was Jesus and called the Christ, and a figurehead known as a Christ or a Christus who was in fact executed by Pontius Pilate. There's no guarantee that these people are the same person, but we do at least have a few breadcrumbs to follow. This is definitely not the same thing as having no evidence for a historical Jesus. That said though, we do have a few more points to get to, so let's move on to the next point. The Gospels are the only source for information on Jesus' life. This is, for the most part, true. If you consider the fact that Tacitus only wrote about the cult and the death of the figurehead, and the only unanimously accepted historical documentation from Josephus talks about the brother and not necessarily about a Jesus himself, then this one is at least true, so we can give this point to the mythicists. So far, historicity has one point, and mythicism has one point. 
The Gospels are proven myths. This point is very contingent on point two. If the Gospels are the only source for Jesus' life, and the Gospels are proven to be myths, then it could thereby be concluded that any contemporary evidence for Jesus is simply non-existent. We would have mentions of James, and that's about as far as we'd be able to go. What does seem to be true is that there are, in fact, historical parts of these documents that are vindicated by historians. These are also double-checked by archaeologists to make sure that there is some physical tangible proof behind these assertions. Yardina Alexandre excavated the first evidence we had of Nazareth outside of the original documents in the Bible. The Bible up until this point, or at least the books therein, was the only source we had of Nazareth's existence. With no physical, tangible proof of its existence, then this city could have been chalked down to myth fairly easily. However, coins, pottery, and even an entire first century farmhouse were found in the location that we would have expected Nazareth to be, due to how it's described in the Bible. There are some mythicists who try to rebut this claim, like René Salm, However, there are non-Christian scholars that rebut this back, as well as numerous other professional archaeologists and historians. This is not to say that historians were right and Psalm was wrong, because historians were experts in their field and Psalm may not have been. No, the thing that put the nail in the coffin of Psalm's argument was that he had no idea what the topography of the site where Nazareth was supposed to be located could even look like. He wasn't even educated in the most recent methods that archaeologists could use, for dating and examination. Basically, he was spouting assertions without having any knowledge on the field itself. Whereas archaeologists using modern methods were able to pull up the aforementioned pottery, among other things. Again, the Gospels were the only known source for this city's existence and location. For the claim that the Gospels are proven myths to pan out as ontologically true, it would have to be demonstrated that everything in them is mythical. But we have found tangible evidence of the areas that the Gospels speak of. And this is not the same thing as, say, Spider-Man being in New York City and us finding New York City, therefore it's evidence of Spider-Man existing. This is due to the fact that there are other sources for New York City's existence. In this case, the Gospels were our only source. So at the very least, many of the locations that are talked about in the Gospels are real, and these claims could not be corroborated with evidence until very recently. The Gospels use fictional literature ideas and copy the Old Testament. This point seems to misunderstand the genre that the Gospels were written in. Speaking plainly, we don't actually know what genre they were written in at all. There are parallels between the Gospels and the Old Testament, and this would be a case in favor of them being unreliable if we could actually pin down the genre that the New Testament is supposed to be. Mike Lacona, for instance, argues that they were modeled after Greek biographies. This, however, is still not a clear answer as to what genre the Gospels were actually modeled in. There is obviously parallel between the Old and New Testament in stories. For instance, there are many parallels between Jesus and Moses. Many of the central motifs of these two characters are shared, what with being savior figures with a decent following and all. This is not to say, however, that the authors of the Gospels were not simply inspired by the writing of their culture and therefore would use parallels in them. Even if they were trying to write a biography, they would still end up calling back to these literary devices. This isn't functionally terribly different than the way that we have shared idioms of speech today. Our colloquially shared idioms is not evidence for the efficacy of what those idioms were supposed to originally represent. If one says bless you to someone else, it does not necessarily mean that blessings have any spiritual power. It's simply an idiom, and if put in writing, would be a literary device. So the Old and New Testament sharing idioms, or characteristic modes of expression in music or art, does not necessarily add or subtract from their veracity. Non-fictional writing of today will still end up using idioms that are common in fiction, much in the same way that fictional writing will still have callbacks to events that happened historically. There's no reason to assume that the writing of 2,000 years ago didn't follow a similar pattern. This is at least contingent on us not being able to discern the exact styling of the writing. If it is true that these are written in the way that Greek biographies would be written, then use of idioms would be perfectly acceptable and natural. If it could be proven that the Gospels are simply parables, which has not been proven to be the case, then the argument for the repeat of literary norms from the Old Testament would hold merit. Currently, though, the shared genre of the Gospels is considered an unknown. As such, any argument for them being fictional, based on shared idioms, holds no weight. But that could be subject to change.
Paul only talks about Jesus as an angel? There is no doubt that there is a lot of debate between what Paul actually saw during the road to Damascus incident. While it is true that Paul provides very little biographical information about Jesus, and he does state that he never knew Jesus personally, he does make it very clear that he considered Jesus to be, at the very least, a real person. There is, on top of this, the aforementioned point of his claim of meeting the brother of Jesus, James. It is due to Paul's interactions with James that he does consider Jesus to be a real and historical figure. As genealogy was determined through the male line at the time, he considered Jesus a descendant of David. Did Paul believe that Jesus had no earthly father? Eh, probably not. One of the arguments from the mythicist position, especially from Richard Carrier, is that Paul must have believed in some kind of cosmic sperm bank that was used to impregnate named Mary, the mother of Jesus. However, when we look at the original Greek of the New Testament, we find that the phrase that is commonly used translates out to, to bring forth from the bowels. He considered Jesus to be of the seed of Abraham, again with the habit of genealogies back then being traced through the male line. If this is the case, then Paul's mentionings of Jesus would be consistent with that of a standard-born human. A human he believed to be the Messiah, but still a standard-born human nonetheless. This is not consistent with Carrier's notion of the cosmic sperm bank. So at the very least, no, Paul did not see Jesus as just an angel. He viewed him as a person who was in fact related to James, a person he claimed to have met, and was a descendant of Abraham through the line of David specifically. Only Mark counts as a source, because all other Gospels copied Mark, so we can only count Mark. Well, unfortunately, this one isn't really that true either. While there is some debate as to when the different Gospels were written, Mark being considered first in many scholars' eyes, there is still plenty of original material in Matthew, Luke, and John. This has led to the idea of a source manuscript called Q, or theoretical Q, but the existence of Q has been debated for years. So let's go ahead and apply Occam's razor and just cut it out and go with what we know. We know that there are four Gospels, and we know that there is unique material in each of them, even if two of them are remarkably similar, those two being Luke and Matthew. But Matthew contains things like an entire zombie apocalypse happening during the crucifixion of Jesus, something not present in any other Gospel. This is not the only thing, but it is one example of information that was not copied from Mark. This is original information, and it is unique to the Gospel of Matthew. While the particulars of this one trait of Matthew are kind of interesting and maybe a little silly, it no less speaks volumes about the, well, volume of Matthew and the other Gospels as well. Jesus was thought of as an archangel. So Jesus was thought of in some scholars' eyes as a type of archangel, and this is actually kind of true. However, this point is a bit of a red herring. It seems to only be inserted into mythicist material in order to add more quantitative data, even if it doesn't actually have any qualitative content to it. As an example, Augustus Caesar was also viewed to be an archangel through certain historical lenses. So if we accept that Augustus Caesar existed as a historical figure, and was also viewed as an archangel through some historical lenses, then the same must be true of Jesus. Whether or not Jesus was a historical figure is not contingent on the viewing of him as an archangel. It is a completely separate issue. So this point is just a red herring. Philos Logos is similar to Jesus. This one actually isn't terribly true. So the language that describes Jesus and Philos Logos is incredibly similar. The meaning and ideas behind this language are completely different, not unlike what we would call in America a cookie being labeled a biscuit in the United Kingdom. When we think of a biscuit in the United States, we think of something completely different, whereas in the United Kingdom, it's something more akin to a scone. We have many of these similar words being used in both regions, but they represent very different ideas. As an example of one discrepancy, Philo characterizes the anthropomorphism of God as a bit of a problem, because his version of God cannot feel any of the things or experience any of the things that we experience as humans. He viewed God and humans as such separate categories that the mere idea of giving hands or feet to a God does nothing but make a feeble attempt to explain God's nature to humans. Moreover, it deprived all ethics of any religious basis. He viewed God 
as incredibly separate from man and categorically so different that anthropomorphizing God was utterly ludicrous, much in the same way that Jesus would have been an anthropomorphic manifestation of God. This is obviously in direct opposition to the idea of God purported in the Bible, a God that can feel emotions, a God that can reason with humans as he did with Abraham, a God that can take form of a human being and stay on earth. These are all concepts that are completely alien to the representation of Logos that Philos characterizes. So even though the standard Christian interpretation of Logos uses similar language to Philos' interpretation of Logos, they are only similar in language. The actual meaning behind all of these principles are completely different. Again, much in the same way that a biscuit means something different in the United Kingdom and in the United States. The Old Testament attests to Archangel Messiahs believed in the first century. This one isn't even a red herring. The Old Testament was not written in the first century. So Old Testament writings attesting to something in the first century is utter nonsense. So I think this particular point can be fairly easily dismissed as a non-issue. This seems to be another attempt to add more quantity to the data points on the side of mythicism, while never taking any time to evaluate the content of the particular data point. And finally, we come to our last point for this video. All outside sources either repeat the Gospels or are forgeries. This is one of those things that can't really be substantiated. Of the known historians that spoke about Jesus or a Christ figure in that time, Tacitus doesn't quote or cite the Gospels at all so his writings are not contingent on them. Pliny the Younger, who was not mentioned earlier in the video, but is no less important here, didn't use the Gospels or cite them as a source for any of his writings either, however substantive they may or may not be. The only passage we can conclusively show is forged outside of the Pauline doctrines is the Testimonium by Josephus that we already referenced earlier in the video. His writings about the brother of Jesus, though, still hold up to scrutiny. It should also be noted that Jesus ben Damnius is one of the multitudes of Jesuses that Josephus writes about, a Jesus who is definitely not the Jesus of Nazareth, who is referred to as the Christ. However, James, who is noted as the brother of Jesus in the 20th book by Josephus, is not referred to as a Ben Damnius, so he's not actually connected to this other Jesus. It should also be noted around this time that Jesus, or the name that we actually would have used back then, Yeshua, was an incredibly common name, not unlike Chris or Josh in the modern era. So the mere fact that there are multiple people who have a very common name who are mentioned in Josephus's writings says nothing to the point of whether the one person who happens to have the common name was a historical figure, the one person in question of course being Jesus of Nazareth. It should also be noted that Josephus did not reference Jesus as the Christ, he referenced him much in the same way that Tacitus did, calling him the so-called Christ, or the Jesus whom others knew as Christ. And again, him referencing a Jesus who was known as Christ, who may be the person who started the cult that eventually blossomed into the religion of Christianity, is corroborated with Tacitus's talks of the execution of Christus. These writings are also corroborated with the four Gospels, since the Gospels speak of Jesus as a living being, a living being who was referenced post-mortem by two other historians later down the road. So all in all, the point is, is that we have many breadcrumbs that lead us to at least a historical figure who would have started what we now know as the religion of Christianity. Now, were there actually multiple Jesuses walking around claiming to be Christ? That may be a subject for another video, but it is one that I have heard from the mythicist position. So in summation, we do have some evidence for Jesus, by a few degrees of separation. We have evidence that at least some aspects of the Gospels are true, and not just myths, due to the correlates found between the locations in the Gospels and topography in the modern era. The Gospels' usage of idioms that are similar to those used in the Old Testament is a red herring, as are the claims of Jesus being an archangel. We've covered the fact that there are at least some differences between Mark and the later Gospels, therefore they did not just copy Mark. And we've noted that similar logo structure of a contemporary philosopher doesn't necessarily mean anything due to the structure being in language only, not in content. We've also gone over the fact that Paul, at the very least, viewed Jesus as a historical figure and not just an angel, partially due to his alleged interactions with James. This is not the only video that I'm going to be doing covering the mythicism debate, but so far it does seem like we've been able to at least award more points to the side of historicity.
Alright, that said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I know that it's a bit different from my normal style, so please let me know in the comment section below if you enjoy this style for history videos. Tell me what I could improve, and let me know what you liked. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon, and I hope I'll be able to see all of you in tomorrow's video. Insert into video tagline? Here.